The Behemoth Brewing Company presents the Department of Conversation with Pat Brittenden. Behemoth, give me something hoppy. I'm a little bit shaken up after watching the documentary. Let's be honest. That's it's a it's a pretty good. it's a pretty hard. Well, it it is good because it it's it's a brilliant piece of work. Um, but fuck, she's a hard watch. Oh, yeah, yeah, she is, eh? And um, but the, I hope the people who should be watching it are watching it. You know. Um, well, let's get into it. Let's talk about it. Well, firstly, ha- hi. How are you? Hi. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> lovely, lovely to see you again. Very good. You you join a very elite group of people to have been back three times. <laughs> three oh, times in 220 it. episodes. <laughs> Thank you for having me again. It's good oh, to be here. Mate, it's a pleasure. And and the last two times we've talked kind of specifically about two other gorgeous pieces of content you've done. One was the Billy TK doco. And then last time it was Emma. And Emma was just... You know, I, I think I messaged you and said, I'm going to watch it again over the holidays. And I did. I watched it again over Christmas because uh, other than being just exquisite storytelling and journalism, you know, some of those beautifully shot shots of Russia and stuff, it's just, it's just a, a delight to look at as well. Mm, thank you. Um, could you maybe, for people who haven't seen or heard of what you guys do at Stuff Circuit, maybe just give us 60 seconds as to who you guys are and what you actually do? Love to, thank you, because lots of people don't know that we exist because it's a sort of a strange little unit in a way um, on a mainstream, you know, online media publication. <clears throat> and we, but we, we're lucky because we get time to uh, spend invested in a project. And we are also lucky because we, by and large, get to choose or at least um, have a you know large say in which projects we do and we and we make these days we make documentaries we used to be current affairs journalists and tv and then tv got rid of us when they were getting rid of current affairs <laughs> <laughs> and that was six or seven years ago now and Sinead Boucher took us on and decided that you know video video would um, be a good way for stuff to go in terms of expanding its long-form journalism and so that's where we've found ourselves is making investigative documentaries um, within a kind of multimedia presentation. So it's it's um, a lot of information, but we try to make it watchable and readable. Yeah. Um, I notice the length of this documentary is forty nine minutes. I notice these kinds of things, <laughs> yeah. um, which is which is kind of a television hour. Is that just? Yeah coincidence or do you guys think even though obviously you're making for stuff which means the stuff that you're making is designed for an online platform but do you think about it being shown elsewhere do you think about you know this could be released to other countries or other other parts of the world or is that just purely you tell the story until it's done and it happens to be 49 minutes this time good enough it's the latter um actually these days it used to be that we had a partnership with um, at one point, Māori television, and it had to be a particular duration. But now we have the liberty. We're funded by New Zealand On Air, and it has to be at least 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, but we have to then decide how long we think it deserves to be. Um, and you have to be really disciplined in that because, I mean, the, I don't want to move too far ahead of ourselves because the, we're on to the next project now, of course, and I feel like this project could be hours and hours and hours long <laughs> so you have to be really disciplined um and in that in the documentary that we're talking about today disordered it was you know the first draft is always much 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 longer and you watch it down and you just you know you feel where it's too slow yeah. and we have the ability since we're multimedia to just take those chunks out and put them into a written feature so you still have the information there but you but the but the documentary itself doesn't um, have to be slowed down or mired in too much detail. Yeah. And you, I, I think you can kind of see that. I'm, and I'm, it'd be interesting to know what you left out, like after your first run through, because you kind of have three people at the start who you're talking to, Thomas, Jody, and Anna. Um, obviously, Thomas's story is kind of the cornerstone of it. Jody appears to give kind of commentary to what, you know, is going on in his brain, we should probably talk about fetal, it's fetal alcohol spectrum disorder that we're talking about. I don't think we've actually said that. 
Uh, but Anna starts off with a very shocking statement where she said, I've had 13 children, um, six have passed. And you're like, wow, whoa, hang on, what? You know, you've lost six, half of your children and you had 13. But then that didn't really, I, I, it sounds really weird to say, wasn't well, she the best talent? I'm not trying to say that, but it seems that maybe her story didn't get fleshed out as much as the other two. Was there, a, was there a reason for that? Just that was the areas that you needed to kind of trim a bit respectfully to her story? Um, yes, there was definitely that. Um, there were issues of privacy around her surviving children. Right. Um, it, but you're right. I, well, sometimes when I watched it back, I thought, oh, that actually, you wanted some answers right there. At yeah. that point I mean, the obvious what? answer is how did they all die? I mean, everyone, I'm sure, wants to know the answer to that question. Yeah. Uh, they were all stillbirths or miscarriages. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that is excised and put into the um, interactive. But you're probably right. It probably should have been within the documentary because you do want to know. Um, but, yeah, there were ish there were reasons that we couldn't fully explore Anna's story a bit more. And actually mm -hmm. one of those reasons is that while she was speaking honestly about her own drinking and substance abuse during her pregnancies, as she said, none of her surviving children – have ever been diagnosed with FASD. And so um, it, that became problematic in itself. Um, it's tricky to describe how to deal with that because uh, one of the things that we try to point out on the project is that lack of diagnosis doesn't necessarily mean there isn't a diagnosis. It can often yeah. just mean that there hasn't been an assessment opportunity or therefore the chance to be diagnosed. Um, and we don't know whether Anna's children have had that opportunity or not. Um, it's one of those strange things with making a documentary where we, we had had other talent lined up for this story, other interviewees who we wanted, whose stories we wanted to tell. And one of them is a woman who we write about in the interactive, and she came out of prison um, during the middle of lockdown, and she wanted to tell her story. Uh, she wanted to explain her own FASD that she had been diagnosed with. But such is the nature of dealing with that, living with it. Before we had a chance to even meet her, she'd been released into um, uh, a, an, an addiction unit when she came out of prison. Before we had a chance to meet her, she was back in prison within two weeks. Right, <laughs> so. Wow. It had been quite a, this is a long-winded way of saying, it had been quite a lengthy process of trying to find the right people to talk to because we wanted this story to be really centred around the people whose stories, you know, should be told. Not not officials and not commentators or experts. Their, their voices needed to be in there, but we wanted to hear directly from those whose lives had been affected by FASD. So when we met Anna, um, we just happened to meet Anna somewhere that we were visiting and it was one of those moments where we just said to each other we we need to interview her her voice mm. is important but it became a voice that was um that wasn't the main narrative of the story although you're absolutely right hers equally could have been we just didn't have as much time with her mm. yeah one of the things that she said that i was <laughs> kind of relating it to what's going on in the world today she kind of said, I was aware of, I don't know, I don't think she called it FASD, but I mean, even for me, that's a new term because I think of fetal alcohol syndrome, but now it's spectrum disorder. Um, and she basically, and she said, and I wrote it down, she said, I didn't believe in it. It's not that I didn't care, I didn't believe in it. And I think, gosh, all those people out there today about, you know, various viruses going on in the world right now, not that FASD is a virus, but, you know, medical things that people are like, well, I just don't believe it, don't believe it. And it's it was an interesting insight into not also stereotyping someone that they had no clue is that maybe they knew about something and didn't have the understanding of what that meant. And we will get onto later in the conversation, a, a huge revelation I had during this as well. Hey, you, you talked about the people you wanted to focus on. What I really would like to do is play the first kind of 60 seconds of the right. actual show, because this is you talking to Thomas. Is he out? Cause he was only out of prison for a week or so. Is he out of prison at this stage or are you He's talking been, to him in prison? This was the day after he was released from prison. All right. And you're talking to him basically about the documentary. Let's just have a listen to, to it's a phone call. And this, this is what people see first in the documentary. So you will get an understanding that when I saw this, I mean, I don't want to, 
It, we, we do still make content. I never want to minimize it by calling it content, but you know, the best kind of content draws you in quickly and this, nothing like it. Have a, have a look. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you just dropped out for a second. Oh. Thank you very much for calling, Thomas. It's yeah. good to hear your, your voice. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah. Um, who are you? Um, <laughs> um, so I'm a oh, journalist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I work for a team called Stuff Circuit. And yeah. we make documentaries. And, and what, what, what's, what's going to involve me and something like that for because we're trying to explain to people what it might be like to live with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. You, you can never explain to someone it's, 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 it's a condition of what, what, what's not seen. Yeah. Because um, yeah. what happens to people who, like you, What happened, what's it like to live with it? Well, not to, well, I never chose this. I never chose this as this. This, this, I never chose this lifestyle that was given to me. You know, just, it's been pretty much my life in jail. No matter how, what I do, what I try. So, um, yeah, that line, it was given to me. It's, yeah. it's, it's just... It's, it's, I mean, I'm still, I can still feel it now. I can still feel the emotion of him saying that line and thinking about all the people uh, and people who are watching, not listening. We've got it in silent now, but that, that's his mum in the background now that we can see the footage of Maureen, um, who uh, now I don't think she actively said during pregnancy, but when you asked her about her alcohol intake, she mentioned two bottles of vodka a day. Um, oh, yeah, I don't that was while she was pregnant. While she was pregnant, okay. Yeah. Um, and and this idea of what we pass on, good and bad, um, whether it's through genes or through actions, uh, and having someone who's spent time in jail, I want to talk a bit about uh, Jody a bit later on, who talks about he's been to jail 17 times. Um, it's, it's just, I mean, <laughs> I texted you last night and basically said, what have you just done to me? What I mean, yes, we're going to have a conversation, but what have you just done to me? This this documentary is not an easy watch, but it's it's an important watch, I guess. Not to be too flippant about it. It's pretty confronting, isn't it? But I'm I'm pleased that it had that effect on you, Pat, because you know it's been a problem here for decades, and and we haven't. This is the point of doing it. We haven't done anything to help people with FASD, and we haven't particularly done anything much to stop new people being born with FASD either. So. We have this enormous problem with alcohol in this country and there's this horrendous side effect that we're paying for in so many ways. So I'm glad it was a bit confronting. Yeah, I mean, it makes you angry. I mean, one of the questions I was going to ask, and this will go all over the place, you know how I roll. And I was kind of setting it up for the end is, how, how the hell do you do these documentaries and then not come a, become a full-time campaigner for the cause? I mean, <laughs> it's just, I just, you'd want to, I just want to help them sort the problem out now. It's like, as a, how do you, how do you as, a, as a journalist, a storyteller kind of keep that distance of on to the next story my big yeah. talking, you know no that's a really good question because you have to do that you have to keep moving on and you can't keep coming back to the same story but it's also a good question because this is our third time in a way looking at this issue because we first became aware of it as a problem in terms of how it intersects with the criminal justice system when we were doing the Tana Porter investigation back in right, 23 right. days on 60 Minutes, and so third degree. And so uh, Tana, of course, had been convicted of the rape and murder of Susan Burdett in 1992, and when we started investigating, he'd been in prison for nearly 20 years, uh, and there was a campaign, an investigation underway, led by private investigator Tim McKinnell and the legal team of Jonathan Krebs and Ingrid, Ingrid Squire, and Eugene Bingham and I at TV3 uh, and Phil Taylor at the Herald sort of took on the journalistic side of that. And they needed new evidence in order to take um, Tainer's case to the Privy Council. And it turned out that that new evidence came to them. And it was because Dr. Valerie McGinn, who's a neuropsychologist, was watching um, the police videotapes of their five days of interviewing Tainer without a lawyer. 
and she contacted, this is on a TV program, and she contacted the legal team and she said, um, I suspect he might have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and that means that he wasn't competent to stand trial. And so, so began the process of um, official involvement from Dr McGinn and that was the first time that Eugene and I met her. So that would have been back in about 2015 yeah. that we became aware of the impact of FASD and the numbers, she talked to us then, of the numbers that she was seeing in the criminal justice system. Then you referred to our um, documentary, our project Emma before, which was about our workmate, Emma Barrett, who uh, was adopted from Russia and she wanted us to help her find her birth family in Russia. And Emma also had fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So somehow the story kept on coming back to us and how we've how we came about how we came to do this kind of third instalment was that Emma and I were invited to speak at a medical conference in Wellington about FASD. Emma did this amazing speech about what she lives with and how she copes. And another of the speakers there was Sarah Goldsbury, who's a neuropsychologist also like Dr. Valerie McGinn. And we end up um, sharing a taxi to the airport afterwards and got talking with Sarah Goldsbury and again heard so much about how many people in this country have FASD, how many people end up in the criminal justice system and what happens to those who don't ever get the diagnosis uh, and what happens to those people is that they fall through the cracks big time and yeah. we pay for it big time. And so through meeting Sarah Goldsbury, we reconnected with Valerie McGinn and decided that this was a project that Stuff Circuit should take on. So so um, respectfully, you kind of have become a lifelong campaigner on some level. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Dr. Valerie um, McGinn, as you say, she was in this documentary and Sarah Goldsbury, who are neuropsychologists. Um, Dr. Uh, McGinn described this, and I'm paraphrasing, for people, because... There's going to be obvious questions, you know, obvious message boards and Twitter accounts and stuff that say, well, you know, we all know good from wrong. We know, you know, they still committed the crimes. They still got to do the time. But the, I, I haven't done, it's not a quote, but I wrote down what she said. She said, they do understand right from wrong. They don't understand how their actions impact other people. And they have, uh, they don't have a good ability to choose right from wrong when it comes to decision making. So uh -huh. they're easily led and um, when it comes to, I know this is right, I know this is wrong, at that point, I don't know whether it's a frontal lobe thing or anything or a risk assessment, they don't have the ability to then decide which way to go. And obviously, on lots of occasions, they make bad decisions. Yeah, really well uh, summarized, with another whole lot of um, aggravating features like the propensity to confabulate, you know, kind of to make things up and to draw two things together and reach a conclusion that isn't right, which is particularly problematic when you're, say, in a police interview situation yeah. and you're wanting to please the person who's asking you questions and so you might go along with what they're saying. Um, yes, Taina Porter, exactly what happened. To a T. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, difficulties with memory, uh, emotional dysregulation, so the, the potential to explode and not manage stress and as Dr McGinn pointed out often even people who do have FASD in the heat of moments like that forget to tell people that they've got FASD and so it right. just spirals and gets worse and worse and worse and all of a sudden they've been arrested yet again. Um, you mentioned uh, Dr. Dr McGinn contacting about Tana Porter and saying maybe this person has it and then it was undiagnosed. I wonder, do you know much about that side of what happens? Because I think we haven't, we're talking about Jody a couple of times. We'll talk about him. I think it was said in the documentary that he'd never been diagnosed with it, although his, his life and his patterns fitted exactly. How does one get diagnosed? Like what is the, with some medical situa situation, there is literal chromosomal evidence or cellular evidence or whatever. How do we diagnose this? How do they know that person A has it and person B doesn't? Right. Um, it's a really rigorous process, and I was fortunate enough to witness this process, um, watching Dr. McGinn assess somebody for FASD, and it took hours and hours and hours. 
Um, that was just the first stage. So mm -hmm. it is taking them through a series of tests which are designed to measure 10 brain domains. So things like executive function and memory and um, a, a whole lot of uh, different brain domains. And they have to have exhibited um, deficiencies in multiple brain domains in order to meet part one of the diagnosis. The second part is to uh, confirm prenatal alcohol exposure. So okay. often that is an interview if you can find her with the mother um, or with other family members who can describe what the pregnancy might have been like and whether there would have been prenatal alcohol exposure. So it's there, there aren't New Zealand specific diagnostic guidelines. They're still in development and we really do need New Zealand specific guidelines. So we, uh, we model ours, most of our, what we do do right with FASD, we model on what happens in Canada and to a certain extent, to a lesser extent in Australia, where more effort has been put into ascertaining things like diagnosis and figuring out some paths to treatment. Um, but, we, but we're a really long way behind uh, the eight ball internationally in terms of everything actually about FASD but the treatment and the diagnosis for the process itself is a really rigorous one and so um, you the, there shouldn't be any concern that there might be misdiagnosis because the process is so strict um, and has so many facets to it that which is part of the reason um, that not enough people are diagnosed because there aren't very many people who are qualified to make that diagnosis in the first place in New Zealand. So that means it's not a, uh, you can't look at a group of cells and say they have got it. It's, it's, a, it's a process through which trained and qualified people have to say this is what the condition is. Correct. I mean, it used to be that um, they had to have, they called them sentinel facial features, and that was back in the days when it was known as fetal alcohol syndrome. And there can be a recognised kind of set of facial features, but only about 5%, I think, from memory of people with FASD actually have those facial features. So that kind of wound its way out of the diagnostic guidelines over time. Mm. Um even though we're speaking openly about the documentary and showing a bit here and there and talking about the issue in and of itself, I, I do want to leave some things for people to discover when they watch it. So I won't, I won't identify too much how this came up, but within the documentary, we also kind of learn that this has been a conversation, especially amongst Māori for 150 fucking years. So when I hear you say about the guidelines, I'm like, well, isn't that, have, have we not had long enough to get this sorted out? I mean, 150 years, is that, I mean, like, which means actually, and I have to tell you, I'll tell you a minute why Andrew Little bugged the crap out of me in your documentary. Um, but, and, and I can't ask you this question because you're not a legislator, but it's like, I guess I just want to state, if 150 years is not long enough, how, how long is going to be? I know, right? Yeah. I think I asked him kind of that question. Um, the, and what you're referring to is a petition taken by Māori to the parliament in 1874, and it was about the wider issue of alcohol and its effects on Māori, but within that petition, um, it said that the parents drink to excess and the babies, uh, and the babies suffer. Mm. So they knew, they knew in 1874, and yet it wasn't officially kind of written into the medical literature internationally until the 70s, and it wasn't until the 90s that New Zealand started to recognise it. In 2002, people who were kind of advocating for people with FAS or FASD started to ask for government help. So it's been, you know, actively two decades of, um, in recent times, but, but yeah, we've known for a century and a half that this is a problem, and Nothing has been done, nothing substantial, substantive has been done to stop it or to assist those who have to live with it. I like how I'm protecting your content so people can share, look at it online. You just say, say what it is. A petition <laughs> in 1874, fine. You can really <laughs> and release that. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I'll tell you about, about uh, Andrew Little, the thing that annoyed the, let's be honest, fuck out of me was when, and you, I'm paraphrasing again, but you kind of said to him, would you take a paper to parliament, or to the cabinet, about this? And, he's, and he basically said, I'm not going to make legislative changes on the hoof. And I kind of felt like you weren't saying, are you prepared to make this change? You were saying, can you talk to your blokes up there in the ninth floor who can make a change about this? And he basically said, we'll see. They're like, oh, we're just asking you to talk about it. We're asking you yeah. to move forward and bring this up in conversation. And he, and he 
a stonewalled you that really and I and I know politicians will get this a lot from lots of people, but the, the conversation was this needs to be looked at. Would your guys look at it? His response was, I'm not gonna make legislation up on the hoof, is what he said. It annoyed mm. the crap. I suppose, um, to be fair, he wasn't going to make that concession right there and then in the interview. What I'd like to think is that he and um, some of the policy advisors at the Ministry of Health have gone away and looked at this documentary and looked at some of the supporting material and looked at some of the concerns from clinicians and advocates who work in this field and looked at the concerns from the Disability Rights Commissioner who spoke to that very point. I'd like to think that they might go away and say, actually... We did say that this was a possibility that we could look at this specific area. Um, it's time to do that. Yeah, I wasn't really expecting him to say right then and there that he would do it, but I hope that I hope that he's thinking about it now. <laughs> and look, I guess it just once again comes back to what you've created. It evoked that emotion in me, and you're being very professional about it, and I don't have to be. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was thinking as well, obviously what we're getting to is a systemic issue, an uh -huh. issue within, within the country and within the culture, uh, and it would appear from what you've shown, but I don't know the numbers, but I would assume impacting Māori, impacting uh, more vulnerable, exponentially more than, you know, uh, the wealthy white class of New Zealand. Would that be a fair yeah. assumption? And the reason I hold my hands up in horror, and I'm not giving anything away here, but the reason you don't know the numbers is because nobody knows the numbers. Like literally nobody knows how many people in this country have FASD and that's the fundamental problem. The World Health Organization came to the then government in 2013 and said, would you like to be a part of this international prevalence study where you can figure out how many people in your country are likely to have FASD? Because then once you know the scale of the problem, you're probably in a better position to, you know, adjust your policy to fix it, right? Well, the government said no. So, and since then, um, we have, the government has come up with a couple of different ways to try to ascertain the prevalence of people with FASD in this country, but people that we spoke to for the wider investigations, and not the documentary, but the wider interactive supporting material, <clears throat> said the the process that we have underway, which is through the Growing Up in New Zealand study, which is that um, Auckland University-led longitudinal study, that's how we're supposedly ascertaining prevalence in this country. But it's not going to work because that study was never set up to ascertain prevalence. So we're going through this kind of pointless process, pretending that we will come out of it knowing the numbers, but we actually won't. So I, I digress because... Um, I think it's really important that somebody acknowledges that we have failed and that actually we do need to properly do the count. Uh, Rawari Ratu, who you saw in that yep. documentary, he leads an organisation which will do its kind of, uh, a kind of prevalence study through Māori-led hui throughout the country, which might give a better idea of prevalence, but it still won't meet the kind of protocol that we the opportunity that we didn't take up from the World Health Organization. The reason that it matters is, of course, it's not until you know how many people have it that you understand the costs and that you understand how many of them might be in the criminal justice system and prisons, uh, that you understand how many of them might be in care and protection through Oranga Tamariki, how many might be in alcohol and drug treatment centers, how many might be being born every year. So the best um, understanding that we can have about the uh, numbers in New Zealand with FASD is to extrapolate out from international numbers. So in Canada, for instance, they say that uh, probably 3% of live births every year are affected by FASD. Now, yeah. Dr. Valerie McGinn puts it at 5% in New Zealand because we have a worse binge drinking culture here. So if 5% of births every year... Uh, affected by F FASD. We have hundreds of thousands of people potentially in this country who are affected by it. it. I mean, and we don't do anything particularly to help them. So the, sta the scale of the problem uncounted is just potentially enormous. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you would start to mention those numbers because I think it was the uh, Disability Rights Commissioner who said 1,900 births a year. 
Now, again, extrapolating that number over 50 years is 100,000 people or 2% of the population. So that's actually quite close to the three to five that you're already talking about. So even if you called it 4% of the population between three and five, that's 200,000 people in society today based yeah. on the last 50 years. And I was this is what I was thinking about. The, the, the funding and what requires from that, what, what aspects of society get significantly supported and funded in, in whatever area of life that's less than 4% of the population? And the answer is fucking tons. Tons uh -huh. of them do. And one of the things, and I said I'd talk about the thing that shocked me most of all, is, and I wonder if, you know, the packaging of the, what this thing is to the community needs to be changed because uh, both uh, Dr. Dun, 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 uh, Dr. Medin said it and later on in the conversation, perhaps Sarah Goldsbury said it, but others said it as well, is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is brain damage. And when I started to think about it as brain damage, I was like, fuck me. I'm like, I, we've all been at school with kids who needed extra help, who needed a teacher aid, who needed something for a learning disability they've got. You know, kids who have an intellectual disability or a way that their brain doesn't operate in a way that makes schooling easy, they get supported. I'm hearing you say we don't have good guidelines. I'm thinking about kids having this when they're six being diagnosed and then supported. And one of the stories you guys tell about Thomas is – Two million bucks was spent on him, basically incarcerating him in the justice system. And I think it was Dr. McGinn again said if a quarter of that had been spent on helping him, he wouldn't be in the same place. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there going, forget the word FASD or fetal alcohol. Uh -huh. Think about if this six-year-old was brain damaged in the classroom, what support system would we need to wrap around that child to give them the choice? I think what I realized while watching this as well, and this is one of the things that was so upsetting to me, is the situation they've been given, as Thomas said himself, has removed their choice. So what yeah. do we need to do as a society to wrap around a support system for the six-year-old or the 16-year-old or the, looking at Jody, 55-year-old yeah, that the gives them back that choice of not having a life that people can look at the patterns and go, oh, yeah, I know what that is because I've seen those patterns before. How do we give them the choice and the support to break those patterns, to give them as, understandably, they have a disability, but as successful, normal, happy, whatever words you want to use there, a life as possible? And that's such a great question, again, because when you look at somebody like Emma, who was the subject of our documentary, when people with FASD are given a life where they're given what they call in this field the scaffolding, you know, for instance, yeah. she's in supported employment. She's had yeah. a supportive family structure that understood what she needed. She's had all of the kind of assistance along the way that's enabled her to live a fulfilling and, and you know, moderately independent life, right? So the point is, and, and Dr. McKim makes this really strongly, that you, if you give people with FASD those opportunities, they will, they can live a very happy and productive life. But we don't do that. And you absolutely hit the nail on the head in terms of the unjustness of the fact that mm. this is brain damage that was inflicted upon them before they were even born. It doesn't yeah. get any more innocent than that. And yet there's, you know, my fear is that there's still such a stigma attached to it that it's somehow perceived to be their fault in some way. I mean... It could not be further from the truth. It is, it is not their fault, clearly. And it's not even, you know, people will probably argue with this point, but I understand what Dr. McGinn was saying. When she doesn't blame the individual women for drinking during pregnancy either, when they didn't know, like you didn't know, that it causes brain damage, yeah. They are gobsmacked, she said, when she meets them later and says, but yes, that alcohol that you're consuming during, consumed during your pregnancy can cause brain damage. People often know that alcohol might cause some issue in pregnancy, but they can't necessarily articulate what it is. If we had clearer messaging around the fact, you know, labels on alcohol bottles, for instance, saying drinking in pregnancy can cause 
permanent lifelong brain damage to the fetus then to the baby then that you know might be a, a a stronger start than what we have which is you know very little at the moment the messages are just not getting through um i think it's probably quite a good time now to play our second clip because we're just talking about someone well not to try and be too um flowery about it but who was given a a, a a poison chalice in their life that they didn't know about and they couldn't do anything about. And they get to a point in their life where they're basically self-loathing. And mm -hmm. this is obviously not everybody, but we've talked about Jody a few times. Jody is 55. He's been uh, to jail 17 times at the time of recording. I don't know if that's changed because some of the things he said in the, in the documentary, he was sort of incriminating himself as to his life today a little bit. Um, but, obviously nothing proven and he kind of just offered this because he said something and then you asked him about what he had just said i'm interested as to what happened the five minutes leading up to this part of the conversation but let's just have a look at kind of 60 seconds of what jody was thinking of himself you know people say i'm a good man but i don't see it in the mirror when you look in the mirror what do you see then yeah piece of shit a piece of shit mate call me whatever you want mate eh? for I am who I am just let me stand where I am hey, please don't knock me down just let me be let me stand where I am for fuck's sake for the only land I'm ever gonna own in this bloody world more than where I stand the day this world fucker buries me. Um, yeah, I can still feel it, like in the back of my eyeballs or whatever. It's and and, and the reason I want to show it and talk about it is I know. I mean, a former talkback host on News Talk ZB, you know, Redneck Radio. I know, I know the comments from from people. I know they're going to be, oh, you know, we all make a choice. We all do this. We all do that. But I had this thought of watching it yesterday, and it's and it's a little bit of a perhaps again flippant and a comparison, but I can't imagine we would give someone a jaywalking ticket who was deaf because they hadn't heard the do -do 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 cross signal not going. In other words, because they did what they did because of their disability, I can't imagine punitive response for that. I can imagine, oh mate, look, it's fine. It's you know, this thing. And so we have other people who have got disabilities. I was going to say far more seriously, let's not compare. But they are suffering punitively because of their disabilities and what it causes them to do. And and it's it's I'm I'm gutted by it. It's horrific. And that's why Paula, I think when I texted you last night, I kind of said I did amazing documentary. I didn't really enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, <laughs> it's not really an enjoyable watch, no, is it? It's, important, I, it's an important watch. Yeah. I mean, Jody's heartbreaking, isn't he? How, how have we as a society allowed someone to be cycling in and out of prison 17 times on, you know, pretty minor charges, really, without anyone ever figuring out um, that this is likely to be his problem yeah. and I, you know we're no experts obviously we're just journalists sitting down to interview him but we've learned enough to know that absolutely his life fits the pattern and then of course as soon as he says that his brother had told him that their mother drank alcohol and and sniffed brasso while she was carrying Jody. well that's you know one of the pillars of uh, leading towards um diagnosis is confirming yep. prenatal alcohol exposure and we confirmed yep. that with a family member after we met Jody just to make sure that that was actually the case and of course we also sought expert opinion on the on what we saw in that interview because we didn't want to run it in the documentary if it might have been something else entirely sure. and so Dr McGinn was kind enough to look at it and of course she can't offer an assessment without going through that rigorous process but she did say that she thought that Jodie's lifetime pattern of 
criminality was probably due to undiagnosed FASD. So how how have we as a society left it, you know, left people like him to the stage where at the stage where all he sees where he looks in the mirror is a piece of shit. Mm. And there's another stage in the documentary. Um, hopefully people might see it for themselves, but I found it utterly I, I mean, just I've never seen anything like it where he physically kind of beats himself up. He smacks himself in the head yeah. because and he, and he doesn't even really, he can't really articulate why. But, but, and he's getting no help for any of this, right? He's getting no help for the way that he sees himself, for the way that he has to live, um, for the way that he keeps on ending up back in the criminal justice system because he doesn't can't get a job because of his dishonesty history. He doesn't have enough money to make all his probation appointments and all of the other appointments he needs to get to. He's set up to fail. And yet he says, I set myself up to fail. It's like, Jody, no, you didn't set yourself up to fail. We are failing you. Yeah. Do you have you had any contact with Jody since this doco's come out? How's he doing? Yeah, Louisa Cleave, the producer on this documentary, has been in contact with him and he's living on the streets in Wellington. Yeah. So for, for people who aren't, I mean, if you watch the documentary, honestly, watch the documentary. But he gets 400 bucks a week and he has to spend 100 of that on transport to make um, appointments to four, four appointments a week to do with, I guess, wins and, you know, social workers and maybe parole officers and that kind of stuff. So a quarter of his money is going on transport. He hasn't got a bank account. He needs uh, an ID to get a bank account. He doesn't have money to get an ID. And of course, to get something like a birth certificate, you need an ID to get it. So that's the cycle that Jody's stuck in. And I, I guess I look at it and I think, is this indicative of what's going on or is this an outlier? And it feels like the story you guys are telling Maybe not to that extreme of no bank accounts, but Jody's story is indicative. Would that was that how you found it? Absolutely, because like I said, we tried to. We, there were so many different people whose stories we tried to tell and didn't succeed for various reasons, um, and we saw similar difficulties for all of them. And, and Thomas Morrison, whose story we do tell. Um, he completely personifies all of those issues as well. Couch surfing when he is out of prison. His rap sheet, you know, is like 29 pages long. Um, and he has the same issues with money. He has the same issues with trying to get into accommodation, hence the couch surfing. He has the same issues trying to get or hold down a job. So, no, Jody is absolutely not an outlier by any stretch of the imagination. He's... Um, I don't want to say typical because, you know, the justice minister, the health minister, I should say, in that interview, Andrew Little, kind of took offence when we went down the path of, um, we said to him that Dr. Valerie McGinn says the biggest care facility for people in New Zealand with FASD is prison. Mm. And he took offence at that because he thought that that was trying to imply that people with FASD have a kind of inevitable path to criminality, which is not what that's saying at all. But what it is saying is that, A, there actually isn't any care facility for people with FASD, and right. B, a hell of a lot of them do end up in the prison system. And so, but, you know, based on uh, the current prison population and the probable numbers of FASD in, this pop in the New Zealand population, there's probably something like 2,000 people sitting in our prisons right now who have FASD. And also, uh, trying to be respectful to the minister, we're not criticising him or his... Well, I guess the criticism that we can lay at the feet of the current government is they're doing nothing about it currently. But if this is something that's been talked about for a literal 148 years, this is actually the literal definition of a systemic failure through generations here in New Zealand. And rather than being offended about it, you know, not, not trying to say that politicians are heroes, but they could be the heroes and solve the situation that's been going on for one and a half centuries. So, you know, to take offense is like, to take offence means you're offended because it's something about you or your organisation. This is not about the current iteration of the people who are sitting on the ninth floor. This is about how the country and especially the people involved here have been let down for probably 15 governments 
or yeah. however many more. I, I don't know. And the Disability Rights Commissioner points that out, that this is not the failure of one government at one point in time, it is the failure of successive governments. Um, it, the Minister did make a series of acknowledgements within that interview. Some of them are more reported in the wider interactive piece than in the documentary. But he, so there's this action plan, right, that the previous national government brought in in 2016, the 2016 to 2019 action plan, FASD action plan. It was supposed to fix the problem. Um, it didn't. It was supposed to be reviewed in 2019 after its three years was up. It wasn't reviewed. And so part of the problem is an, a, a, a lack of willingness by politicians and officials to recognise that this um, much vaunted strategy that they came up with didn't work. And there's lots of reasons that it didn't work. <laughs> and if you listen to the experts, they can set them all out for you. One of the problems seems to me to be that officials within the ministry who aren't experts in FASD are not necessarily seeking the advice of the people who are experts in FASD. And so you're not getting um, the benefit of their wisdom about what might be likely to work. I mean, Valerie McGinn says in the interview, you know, she, internationally, she's con yeah. she is an expert in FASD. She, she, her uh, papers have been published and peer-reviewed internationally. She's a, she's a world-renowned expert, but nobody in New Zealand in terms of <laughs> policymakers or politicians ask her what we should do about the problem. I mean, what? I have to, uh, and I'm not saying you were flustered, but Paula, I've never really seen you flustered or kind of shocked. But when she said, I'm a world expert, they've never asked me. You're like, what? <laughs> what? what? That makes no sense. I go, by the way, I've got the best cricket coach in the world sitting out the back, but you black caps, you should definitely not approach them and ask for their information. We'll just leave the best cricket coach in the world. We'll just yeah. let them out the back talking to the international teams because they want their help. But black caps, you should just leave that person alone. It makes no logical sense whatsoever. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it? I think it's, um, you know, people just don't, maybe there's just an, a lack of willingness. There's two things, a lack of willingness to accept that we haven't actually achieved what we set out to achieve. And there's also a fear that if we do acknowledge and measure the extent of the problem, it's going to cost a shitload of money to deal with it. But the point that Paula um, the Disability Rights Commissioner uh, makes in our interview with her is that we already spend at the Ministry of Health's own conservative estimate $450 million a year on dealing with this problem. There are lots of Thomas Morrisons on whom we've spent $2 million incarcerating uh, him and putting him through the criminal justice system. Why not spend it before we get to that stage? I have an an opinion-based question for you, which sometimes is hard for a journalist or an investigator. But And I'll give me a second. I know I'm long-winded at the best of times, Paula, but I'll expand it out a little bit. Um, I wonder how much of this, and I'd like your opinion on this part once I explain it, is appearance of the government not wanting to kind of, you know, be soft and dole out money to those, those you know, those, those bludgers, those guys. And the reason I ask that is I'll never forget when I worked for ZB, as a talkback host, the typical caller wanted everyone to sit in prison and be as uncomfortable as possible and have no money spent on them and they should just sit there and fucking suffer for what they've done. Down this neck of the woods, I think they call it the Milton Hilton, that was it was revealed that they were having underfloor heating. And all these callers phoned up and they're like, oh, I can't afford underfloor heating in my hour. But then when it was revealed that the reason they had underfloor heating was it was actually the cheapest, most cost-effective way to keep that building warm. So in other words, it was done because it was a financial decision to spend as little money on the prisoners as possible. But right. the appearance was, oh, actually, I should probably say, obviously it's effective in that kind of stuff as well, but it was cheaper than getting radiators or anything else. But the appearance was these guys are living in luxury. This fucking government's doling out money to these people and they should just suffer. How much of the inaction of government, S, with S on the end, do you think is they don't want coming up through short election cycles to be seen of doling out money to all these people who innately look like they're committing crimes and causing trouble in the community? Mm. Yeah, good question. I don't know what the percentage of the response is that. I'm sure that that is an element of it. But I also think that there's a fundamental problem which is that having that conversation means that we need to have a conversation about our relationship with alcohol in this country, which right. is costly in so many different spheres, aside from this one. And 
um, you know, there's another whole investigation uh, into the influence of big booze in this country. And I think that that has got a fair amount to do with the fact that there hasn't been a great deal of pro progress. I also think that um, it's a it's a it's a it's not a sexy issue. It's no. not you know, <laughs> nobody really wants to attach their identity, their personality, their campaigning to this issue because this is problematic and thorny and ugly and difficult to fix, although not necessarily when you speak to the experts expensive to fix potentially but it's hard it's hard in the sense that you know there's no cute poster child for it there probably are lots of really cute poster childs for it but the children for it um but but it just doesn't play out that way it's it's there's there's like I alluded to before there's a stigma attached to, to it and I don't think that people are particularly interested in becoming you know too involved actually I think that we need to change the narrative and turn it into helping kids with brain damage. Yes. You know, who's going to fight against that? Who's not going to want to get behind that? Who's not going to want to host a red nose day for helping kids with brain damage. And, Somebody... and we're talking about the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff and the fence at the top of the cliff. And as is always, there's a transitional period and it might take a generation to hopefully eventually remove the ambulance from the bottom of the cliff because you know, people who are in prison now for committing crimes with or without fetal alcohol spectrum disorder are still going to, you know, be in prison. But the idea is in a generation from now, that 46-year-old sitting in prison today, who is currently a two-year-old with fetal, won't end up there. Mm -hmm. And and I just, yeah, I, I, I feel like if that was more the, not the, I mean, I actually really respected what Jody had to say, and I was really appreciative of his experience. But if the poster child was the four-year-old with brain damage and not the fifty-five-year-old who's been into prison seventeen times, I wonder if that would, to quote you, make it sexier. <laughs> Might be the wrong way to think about it, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, I mean, somebody that we met in the process of this investigation said maybe we should take the alcohol out of FASD, give it a different diagnostic name and that might help with precisely that issue because of the lack of comprehension still that it's not that person's fault because it's got alcohol associated with the diagnosis that in some way it comes back on that person um, that they've ended up having a difficult life when it is right. probably not their fault I think you're I think you're you know and other people that we spoke to make comparisons between and you never want to trade one disability off against or compare obviously but other types of brain damage or spectrums or um uh yeah, yeah they get help because there's not that stigma associated with it so yeah i think i think you're right so when they talk when talk about taking the word alcohol out what i'm hearing you say is that um the word alcohol implies I've done it to myself with alcohol, whereas actually it should be a capital F because it's fetal. It's happened in utero. That's actually the that's yeah. actually the, the the place where it's happened. So you have no control. Hey, be um, hey, no, it shouldn't be. And and look, I, I when I have emailed you and stuff for the last couple of weeks, and I didn't realize you had written about you know one of the main guys, Thomas, passing away. Um, and but I but it is something that's public, so it's not a it's not a. a I I feel uncomfortable talking about spoilers when it comes to documentaries. It's not like he's Luke Skywalker's father or anything. But you know it's 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 out there. It's public, so we can uh, we yeah. can talk about it. When you told me that someone was in jail and someone had, had passed away, um, I saw when it came up in the documentary, and there was the video Zoom call, and I knew what it was. And even though I knew what was coming. It was it was devastating to watch and hear. Um, when you hear so so for clarity, Thomas passed away, codeine overdose. The the way the the story is told, because he gets confused and because of because of his fetal alcohol, um, he he basically probably made a mistake and didn't realize what he had, or he was trying to take them to try and make himself feel better and and OD'd and passed away. And his granddad, and oh my God, Paddy. 
his granddad who who you know as when he when he talks about him with such love he never had a chance and i wish he was still here to tell his own story it's just it's heartbreaking heartbreaking how do you feel like at the very start of this podcast i played that interview where you hear thomas's voice how do you feel with that little interaction you had about it and is there anything you want to say about that part of the documentary i mean I don't really know what to ask you about that. I'm not a good enough journalist myself to figure a decent question, but just, I guess, kind of throw you the ball and go, it's, yeah. the tragedy of the the documentary is you weren't able to have, you know, Thomas involved himself in any significant way. It's weird, isn't it, to make a whole documentary with somebody who's kind of the center of the narrative and actually never get to meet them because mm. they died in the middle of the process of making, you know, we were in lockdown when he came out of prison, so we couldn't go straight down to Kawarau to interview him. And a week later, he was dead. And, you know, we felt, I write somewhere else about how we felt like we got to know him quite well because we'd read all his probation reports and we had read his criminal history and judges' sentencings and that kind of thing and and then had that phone call and got to know him a little bit more in that. And so, oh, it was... Uh, you know, his lawyer said that, she said, I don't like this word, but I was gutted when she mm. heard the news. She actually told me on the phone that she was pissed off. And and I'd like to um, give kudos to, you know, I keep on saying that the system does nothing. Well, actually, people within the system do, do a lot. And she's one of them, Leah Davison, his lawyer in the public defence service, would ring him every day when he was in Spring Hill Prison because she knew how hard it was for how wow. he just wasn't coping. Um, and she had fought so hard, as had Dr McGinn, um, to get uh, disability support services, which he was entitled to because of a mild intellectual disability that he also had, as well as his FASD. He was entitled to disability support services since 2019 uh, when he was assessed as being entitled to them. And uh, they never arrived, and they never arrived again last year when he was sentenced yet again and those steps had been that that pressure those requests had been underway for weeks and weeks to get some help in place for Thomas when he was released from prison it didn't happen um and and the judge you know he, in the special circumstances called so the, the justice system has done is doing better than many sectors in terms of trying to recognize and help people with FASD. And so Thomas appeared in the special circumstances court, which was better tailored to his needs. And Judge Barbara Morris gave him last September a really compassionate sentencing about how we had tried imprisonment over and over again and it hadn't worked and it was time for a new approach. So you know, there are individuals within the system who tried to help, but overall, as you say, it was a systemic problem, and, this, and the problem, and, this, and the system didn't save Thomas from what was a very foreseeable death, and we were, you know, it was horrible that day when we found out as a journalistic team just trying to tell this guy's story that something yeah. so predictable had come to pass, Um and so we decided that, you know, it could have gone either way. We could have gone, well, shit, you know, our main talents died. Mm. Um, but we decided that actually that helped to tell the story, that helped the, to tell the story of the ways that we are failing people like Thomas. Thomas shouldn't have died. Thomas, Thomas is, <laughs> sorry, that's the <laughs> Thomas should not have died in that way. He should not have died at 42 years old. And we decided that um, perhaps it would be useful to include all of that within the narrative of yeah. the documentary so that people could see for themselves that there are very serious and tragic outcomes to the way that we're failing people with FASD. Um, I think I asked you probably about Emma documentary the same question but because you've just brought it up about how you once he passed what you decided you were going to do with someone who is and it's really interesting watching you talk to uh jody about why why are we making a documentary and he's a little bit like oh i, I, I the way that it comes across is i kind of get it but i kind of don't how do you ensure that you guys are 
um, and I kind of want to say ethical, but that would imply that you might not be ethical, <laughs> but to make sure that you don't take advantage of the subject or the subject matter and something where they are so obviously impaired in sharing with what they want to share. How do, how do you guys cover that off? Um, it's, a, the, it's a lot about communication. It's about informed consent going into the filming process. It's about uh, ongoing communication during the making of the documentary. And it's about continuing that communication once the documentary has finished and the publication is out there. Um, because that's difficult. You know, some of that process can be difficult for anybody, uh, even without a brain impairment, without brain damage. So it's beholden upon us to make sure that we take extra care. Um, and in Thomas's case, obviously, he's no longer here to have that communication with. But uh, I just got off the phone this morning to his granddad because this has been hard for him too. It's incredibly sad for him having to see a documentary come out about his grandson, you know, his grandson who called him dad it's really hard for him so we feel a duty of care and responsibility to keep in touch with those people and and make sure that they're doing okay i i, I always think paula when i watch your stuff when i grow up i want to be like paula penfold so it's another one of those situations today and this is the time where i always ask the same question and you go can't tell you that um but what are you working on next what's the next documentary <laughs> It's funny because you um, just uh, as we started this conversation, I was deep in the structure of it, writing the structure, and I'm excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't tell us anything. But I can't tell you. But I'd uh, love to come back and talk to you about it because I think oh, you'll be sorry. really, I think you'll be really interested in it. I think it's going to be a really, um, I think it's going to be one of the most important things we've done. Wow, Struth, that's a, uh, that's exciting. So the it's disordered. It's on Stuff Circuit, the only place you can see it, I'm assuming. And there's also the interactive uh, side that goes with it. Uh, if you just look up Stuff Circuit, this is, I mean, I think I just Googled Stuff Circuit then. And the very first one on Stuff Circuit, or the second one is disordered. So, and right. there's a, a bunch of resources, you know, go through, find out more about these people. Um, love, the, um, love the graphics. Always say to you, congratulations to your team. Always looks amazing. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'll just say again, although being a podcast, it's not like people have tuned in and out, like on a radio station. So I've already said this, so people have heard this, but you know, this is a, a this is brain, this is kids in New Zealand and people in New Zealand who are brain damaged through no fault of their own, who have damage to their brain, literal. And we need to yeah. figure out a better way to do it. And I, I would rather think about wrapping around six year olds in school and helping them not end up going to jail for 17, 17 different times and ending up on the street, as we sadly have just heard, then be telling someone else's story with whatever play stuff iteration is in the year, you know, 21, 22 about this thing that's still going on on the 250th anniversary of Maori first telling government, Hey, there's a problem here guys. And still having nothing have happened. So yeah. Can it's I just do a problem. shout out since you mentioned the team and yeah. since we're looking at that amazing graphic of oh, the title for the documentary Disordered Against That, you know, I, I, I'm i so lucky to work with Toby Longbottom and Phil Johnson and Louisa Cleave and the how do you make a documentary about FASD, particularly when the main person who you wanted to interview died so you didn't even get to film them and you have no pictures of them. Um, they, these guys just always astound me with their genius in terms of coming up with visual metaphors, visual ways that we can tell the story. And that particular sign was one that Toby Longbottom would go past every day on his way to work, and he loved the how he loved how broken but beautiful it was. And so that was his idea for um, a way to get into the visual, the visuals of telling the story. It's amazing. I, and I I guess the thing about this world we're living in right now, Paula, uh, that we're moving towards digital, it's still, you know, television still seems to rule with eyeballs. Um, but I just think this is something that as many eyeballs as possible should be seeing it. And I know stuff has a huge audience, a million views a day to the stuff websites. So I'm sure it's been seen a lot. But um, I don't know. I just see stuff like this and I go, it, it, it's, a, it's a there but for the grace of God situation. You know, I Absolutely. grew up in a in a middle-class white family with Catholic Irish parents. 
um, who might have enjoyed a tipple, but I'm sure, but mum didn't drink because they understood it while, I, while she was pregnant and I had every advantage given before me. It's a definition of what privilege is, you know, privilege is those choices that are made for you that you have no control over that make your life better. This is the opposite, yeah. right? It's, it's choices that are made for you that make your life worse. And if yeah. we can understand that for a more, maybe that engenders empathy. If we engender empathy, that maybe engenders change. If it engenders change, then we're only as strong as our weakest link and everyone is better for it in two, five, 10, 20, 40 years from now. Totally. If people should not be judgmental. It is totally a there but for the grace of God situation. It could have happened to many of us. Yeah. Um, and so the kind of the stigma and the the judgment that that happens is absolutely not deserved. Yeah, but thank well, you for coming up so well. Oh, and look, thank you for joining us. Anytime, you know me. Anytime you want to come on, come on and tell us what your amazing life's all about and what you're doing at the moment. But this is amazing. Everyone should check it out. Disordered on Stuff Circuit Stuff and look it up, or just Google it, and you'll get a link straight to it. And thanks for your time today, Paula. Thank you very much, Pat. See you next time.